today's main event. This webinar is for NSP 1, 2, and 3 grantees and their partners. It's intended to help you learn how to incorporate green construction standards into rehabilitation and new development to meet NSP goals for cost-effective, sustainable design and energy efficiency. Our presenters will include topics on ideal program components, a case study of current NSP green construction, and available NSP resources. With us today are Armin Magnelli of Livable Housing, Inc., and Ruben Teague of Green Coast Enterprises, also Amy Hook from the Green Communities Program at Enterprise Community Partners, and we also have John Laswick and Bree McLean of HUD, uh, who don't have a formal presentation role, but uh, will be around for uh, answering questions that uh, may come up that they can help out with. So welcome to you all. And let's see what we're working on today. Uh, what it takes to go green. We'll be looking at uh, those uh, four ideal program components or those ideas. And uh, then we'll take a look at special green topics that you see listed there. And uh, Amy will close it out with resources for regulatory issues. So let's. Uh, welcome, Armand Magnelli, and you can take it from here, Armand. Hello. Hey, Kent. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Okay. So we're looking at slide five, Green Communities Initiative. All right. So uh, one of the things I have points I want to make is that uh, the Green Communities Initiative web page has a great set of criteria for going green. And uh, I often refer people to their criteria as a guideline because there's such great content within the criteria about different ways to achieve green. It's also a good checklist for um, uh, the different categories of work within green. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today talking about the different categories, but uh, I would uh, I still think that that, uh, that criteria is a great tool. Ted, would you go to the next slide for me? So the greenhouse, your green housing rehab strategies <coughs> uh, really ought to suit these different categories uh, of work. So you have to keep in mind climate. Climate has a big impact on several different strategies you might employ trying to go green. Um, your uh, housing stock, obviously, would have a big uh, effect on, on, on your green um, strategies that you might employ. We'll talk a little bit about the different types of, of strategies that uh, housing stock are affected by. Your market, obviously, is a big variable. The one that folks talk about most often is budget. Do we have enough money to do this? And then uh, we'll talk about the budget. But I think most important, we have to think about who's going to be living in the building and uh, what are their needs. And that, that has, I believe, the biggest impact on our green strategies. So I'm going to quickly run through these. Climate. Um, in terms of uh, climate, the, the most obvious is, is insulation requirements relative to green. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to show you a few examples of this in Energy Star recommendations. Uh, I'm going to make a recommendation that if you're not already doing it, that uh, an auditor who is experienced in energy and modeling buildings for their energy usage uh, work with you on making decisions around insulation is very important because they are they are trained to deal with the climate issues. Um, HVAC equipment has a huge impact on is, is hugely impacted by climate. Uh, certainly, the systems you would employ on the Gulf Coast would be very different than uh, Duluth, Minnesota, or uh, Portland, Maine. 
ventilation strategies, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later in my section, uh, are, are hugely, again, affected by this. Uh, humidity levels have a, a big impact on uh, these kinds of strategies. Water conservation standards, uh, but you know, certainly folks on the Gulf Coast have fewer problems with uh, access to water in many ways than the folks, say, in Arizona. Moisture control, again, and uh, obviously landscaping. All of these things are affected by climate. And we have climate zones uh, that have been assigned by various folks. This is, this is a typical climate zone map, and you can all look at the map and figure out what zone you're in. Interesting how the different bands of color across the country, and uh, where I'm living in South Central Pennsylvania, actually is very similar to some states in the Southwest in some ways. Uh, the as an example of how climate affects your strategies, I'm going to show you some examples of. Energy Star recommendations that are climate-based, and these are specifically about insulation levels uh, for retrofitting existing wood frame buildings. So, in this next slide, this is right off of the Energy Star website. There, you can see based on the zone, hopefully you remember what zone you were in on the map, uh, they have recommendations about the uh, insulation you R value that you should add to an uninsulated attic. If you have some existing insulation in the, in the attic, often homes have a three to four inch uh, layer of existing uh, bat insulation, you might add those levels of R value. Uh, and so those are recommendations for attics based on zone, your climate zone. And then the flooring, you can see again, there's, there's different numbers recommended for the uh, floor if the floor is part of the building envelope. So there gives you a good idea, a good example of how climate affects the strategy of insulation levels. And they also have some recommendations for insulating wood frame walls. We often get questions about different uh, ways people sh should consider doing this and often uh, installing blown insulation into empty wall cavities is is used, and that is one of the recommended strategies uh, that the Energy Star folks are are, are referencing here. And uh, they're also saying that in some zones, uh, adding uh, a insulating wall sheeting, which is typically a foam board, to the exterior has significant benefit as well. So in zones three and four, adding R5, beneath siding, uh, or zones five and eight, perhaps going up to R6, would be a good idea. And uh, this foam board does a great job of creating a continuous uh, R value around the entire outside of the building. And if you're re-siding, it's certainly something to consider. So these are all examples of how climate affects recommendations that people make for particular green strategies. So let's think about housing stock for a minute now. Uh, consider the differences between these different types of homes. Single story, detached home. Uh, some folks would call this a rancher. It might be a shotgun home in different places. Uh, you might have two story detached homes that are typically quite a bit bigger than your standard single story detached and uh, and then uh, townhomes, row homes. All of those would suggest very different strategies for approaching uh, greening, especially related to insulation and air sealing, but also in terms of ventilation. Uh, as examples, we have typical housing types here that I'm sure many of you are all used to. Um, and we've got the rancher on the upper left-hand corner that many people will be very familiar with, which is also similar 
to other types of stock. This that particular rancher has an attached garage, which makes it perhaps a little bit different. And then we have the Cape and the two-story Colonial and the four-square. All all standard types. Uh, in the Cape and two-story Colonials, the insulation of the uh, upper floor is very tricky because the the roof, the slope of the roof, is actually part of the the room um, ceiling in those in those housing types. Makes it very tricky. Market. There's another big variable that I mentioned before, and this one, there's some key questions to consider. Uh, what do consumers value? What will greening differentiate your homes? This whole idea of uh, can you use greening your projects as a way to, to uh, make your homes appear more appealing in, in the marketplace, to stand out from others? Um, but another way to think about market is, is uh, to think about what is available for greening your, your homes in the marketplace. Uh, what products are locally available? And can the contractor market handle uh, uh, using particular strategies? We'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. But the, we strongly recommend <coughs> that you have a good understanding of what contractors can handle what they're used to using in terms of materials and methods, and what products are locally available. Um, everyone asks about budget. How much more will these things cost? How much we can't afford anything else is a constant refrain. But um, there are some things we can do that are low cost and have incredible return on investment. Um, and figuring out which of those, which strategies have the best return on investment and which uh, green strategies might have a significant impact on the success of your, of the occupants of the units uh, is pretty important. And I'm making a differentiation here between return on investment and success because I think health, for instance, so many green strategies uh, make units healthier and therefore uh, make the occupants healthier and make their day-to-day uh, -day lives much better in many ways, not the least of which would be uh, fewer days, sick days out of school, fewer sick days from work, all of which can certainly impact on a uh, household success. But the bottom line is, what can you afford within your budget as well? Big issue, clearly. So there are some green methods that have little cost uh, involved in, in, in implementation. I am a big fan of, you, of doing air sealing. Air sealing is uh, a strategy I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, but it's essentially uh, uh, pl plugging leaks that can lose energy and create other problems. The use of low or no VOC paints, caulks, and sealants is becoming much easier. Just in the, in the course of the last couple of years, the, the price point for low, no VOC paints has come way down. The availability has gone way up. Uh, thank you to the state of California for are very sensitive to, the, to VOCs, and this, this can have a big impact. Low flow plumbing fixtures, if you're replacing fixtures, is a very simple thing to do. Very high return on investment. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And Energy Star Lighting. Um, it's also got a great return on investment. Some, some approaches do have a, a higher first cost, but also increase savings uh, in operation, and certain, certainly insulation and in the installation of higher efficiency HVAC appliances uh, are both good things to do in that regard. In 2009, Enterprise produced a report evaluating cost-effectiveness of a bunch of different criteria, and this is based on lifetime savings and direct savings that come from energy and water conservation measures. And uh, key findings here 
were that the cost to incorporate their green criteria cost this much on a per dwelling unit. This is, this is the reflects the implementation of a significant uh, number of green criteria, uh, really creating a very healthy and efficient unit, and lifetime savings exceeding exceeded the um, initial cost according to this study. Um, to meet energy and water criteria, the cost was just under 2000 per unit, and those two measures produced uh, lifetime savings of almost $3,000. Quickest payback, though, was water conservation. Uh, installing water cons conserving fixtures could, could uh, uh, create savings in the range of 350 to almost $1,000 per home. Uh, and cost can cost as little as eighty dollars a uh, property. So very good return on on investment there. Of course, this is to some degree um, sensitive to the water, your local water costs. In some markets, the the return on investment would obviously be much higher. Um, we sometimes neglect the healthy side and uh, of green and thinking in terms of the occupants, there's, there are some particular health issues that you may have in your housing stock that you want to pay special attention to. If you have high humidity levels, moisture problems, mold is certainly an issue, older housing stock, lead-based paint, but indoor air quality is almost a universal issue. Um, there are studies that show significant health improvements with green housing. This is a study uh, that was done, um, and this reflects the number of symptom-free days in a two-week period uh, based on some very standard uh, green healthy homes measures. And you can see uh, this is, these were for asthmatics, folks with respiratory problems. Their symptom-free days uh, went from 7.6 to 12.4 days over two weeks. That's a huge difference over two-week period. And um, on plan trips, um, visits to urgent care, uh, again, statistically, is a really significant difference over the period of one year. Uh, quality of life, a little more subjective measure, but certainly caretakers um, have have a much higher quality of life in a, in a healthy home. Uh, so, having, having gone, done a quick survey of different things that we su suggest you should consider when taking this into account, let's talk quickly about ideal program components for green housing rehab program. We, first of all, suggest strongly a housing rehab standard that includes green measures, green methods and materials. Um, and we think that we, it's really important to, to use both um, KISS and ROI. Keep it simple and think return on investment. Having that philosophy, having a standard in mind, uh, we're, we're supporters of specifications that are very precise in, in uh, calling out particular methods and materials, and it is extremely important to make these locally available and acceptable. These are, uh, uh, this concept of locally available and acceptable is really important, and uh, I'll, I'll stress that probably several times. Training is, is crucial as well, especially if you're, if you're suggesting methods, methods and materials that aren't um, as common as, as others, and uh, we'll talk I have several slides on the training component, and obviously construction supervision. Uh, there are particular phases in construction where you're going to want to pay particular attention to uh, installation of methods and materials. So this, these are our ideal program components for incorporating green into your housing rehab projects. Um, the NSP uh, Neighborhood Stabilization Program Resource Exchange webpage has 
lots of great free tools uh, in it. And if you go to toolkits on the exchange, the um, there are several documents under this category of rehabilitation and construction management that are on topic here. There is a sample housing rehabilitation standard that has green measures incorporated into it. There is a set of specifications that are both standard rehab specifications and green specs in a, in a little library of assortment of these uh, typical specifications, and there's also an inspection checklist that can be used. There's instructions uh, at the beginning of each of these documents for how they are used in the field. If you went to the rehab and rehabilitation construction management section of the toolkit, and these are some of the sample documents you'll talk, you'll see. There is uh, this green housing development guide. It's developed by Enterprise, a great tool. And then those those other three documents that I mentioned uh, are here: the uh, sample housing rehab checklist, the specs, and the uh, template for housing rehabilitation standard. There's also a contract, another useful document in that section. So, uh, given our minor technical difficulties, I'm not going to surf off to that site. It's very easy to get to. This is the link to toolkits. If you Google uh, NSP Resource Exchange, it'll take you right to that page. Very easy to get get to those documents. And again, there's a huge volume of free documents uh, on the toolkit page, uh, not just on the topic of rehab and green, but uh, extensive selections on other topics as well related to NSP. All right. So quickly, rehab standard. I just want to I want to give you a, an example of what one, uh, a typical standard looks like. Um, it, it's, rehab standards are useful when they define minimum requirements for finished products. They give you good guidance on when to remove something or repair something or replace it. Uh, the creation of the standard helps build consensus among the partners, and it makes uh, your product much more consistent if you have a standard that you can measure your projects against. So as a quick example, here's, here's a sample standard for water heaters. Um, saying that each unit has to have a working water heater. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, it gives uh, uh, an age less than three years old, minimum capacity. Um, older water heaters may be repaired if it's going to make it operable. Uh, and this is a, a standard for a market where uh, natural gas is typically available, so it's saying all electrical water heaters will, replace, will be replaced with gas fire because they're much more efficient. And so that's the repair standard, and then the replacement standard would be if you're going to put a new one in, a uh, 40-gallon gas-fired 10-year warranty. Um, and high-efficiency models are being required. Or uh, an option listed here is uh, a tankless model as an option. So that's an example of a standard. Now, the standards are different than specifications. This is calling out the conditions under which you might repair or replace a unit and, and what you'd replace it with or repair it, what condition it would be repaired to. Here's an example of a specification for a fairly sophisticated um, power vented gas fired hot water heater. It's a very efficient model. It's a tank style, much like the standard tank style water heaters that we're all familiar with, but it has some advantages. And so this is this is an example of one of the specifications that's available uh, on that in that toolkit document. I don't expect everybody to read this quite a bit of text right here, but it gives you a sense of the level of detail. Any questions at this point? We've gone over program components, giving examples of specifications and standards. 
Can't we see any questions that we might want to answer this There are none in, but let me just remind people how to get to, uh, how to ask us questions. There's two ways to do that. We, again, we prefer verbal questions. And click your raise hand button underneath the participant list. And uh, there we've got one from uh, Lee. And uh, hello, Lee. What's your question? Hi. Uh, question for Armin. Um, are these specs going to be incorporated into Housing Developer Pro? Uh, they are available in Housing Developer Pro. It's just spec rating and cost estimating software application. Do we need to download an upgrade or an update or anything to get that? Um, Lee, if you, uh, if you email our support page, we'll get you a set. Very good. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Lee. Any other questions? Uh, just a reminder to click your lower hand button now that you've asked your question. Um, so it's easy to, to get in the queue. Just to click your raise hand button or you can submit a written question and we will get to that at the next break. So, so All right. So let me to quickly finish up my presentation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about training. I've mentioned this as an important component. Uh, you know, the folks that are in the trenches, that we have specialists and whatever partners you have involved in your NSP projects, uh, they, they need to know what, what kinds of things you're, uh, are in within your standards and your specifications, and obviously contractors must need to know your requirements. We've had some significant success at training folks that's involved in programs. We've, we've also trained contractors. Um, both generals and subs, and on occasion we've, if there are building performance contractors or energy auditors involved in the program, they, they could also uh, stand to be oriented to the program's uh, uh, different strategies. Um, what do we train them? Well, you know, whatever your standards are, so if using the green community criteria, that would be it, but um, Certainly, all the developers and the local government need to know what your standards are. The contractors, on the other hand, are the ones that see the specifications. Um, developers, your rehab specialists, partners need to know when to apply the specifications and also how to enforce them. Key things. So training is helpful for them. And a lot of times, it's, it's helpful to give them a little bit of background on the building science behind why you're asking them to do stuff. But ultimately, the contractors need to know what, what's being required of them in the specifications, and this is uh, that's that's essentially what the contractors need to be trained on. Um, we've done classroom trainings for any number of folks. I'm very fond of doing in-field training, on-site training with contractors. We've we've had some really great success. Um, doing training in the field. Uh, for example, this is a slide of uh, one of many sessions we held in Columbus, Ohio with their program. Ken stands with the baseball cap and the light blue shirt for the city of Columbus. They're greeting a number of the contractors. You can see they all have their coffee. I don't see any of the donuts in hand at the moment, but uh, that was definitely part of the training as well. And <laughs> we did this on site at a at a home, it was an NSP home, which is now completed, and we did we demonstrated many different aspects of things that we were building into the specifications. For example, this is damp spray cellulose insulation being blown into wall cavities. We had a, uh, a subcontractor that demonstrated this for folks, and it's a, quite a cool process. We also had other suppliers there. This was a this caulking and sealant. Uh, supplier here who's demonstrating very particular products for um, doing air sealing and, and weatherization with uh, caulks and sealants. Uh, Home Depot Corporation helped <coughs> sponsor this by get, gathering uh, suppliers to come to this. This, this particular person uh, from OSI also gave away free samples. Uh, contractors got a lot of good information out of this exchange. We had window uh, company, uh, Owens Corning Fiberglass was there. Lots of different uh, entities showed up, and uh, we did several different 
types of training for folks on site, including hands-on demonstrations and things. Great tool for getting people on the same page. Relative to construction supervision, I'm going to suggest this Energy Star Thermal Bypass Checklist uh, is a great tool for uh, checking off the different areas of a house that should be air sealed. Uh, you definitely want to check, inspect open wall cavities for air sealing after any of the rough mechanical work is done, but before insulation is installed. And that's the ideal moment for air sealing to happen, all the caulking and foaming of holes and penetrations through the envelope. And it, after that's done, inspecting it is a great idea. Uh, a spot that's typically missed is behind, behind tub shower units and at band joists between floors, uh, where porch roofs to join building envelopes. These are often spots where there are huge gaps uh, letting um, unconditioned air from the outside leak into the building. Again, uh, strongly recommended that you inspect after ins uh, installing insulation, and we strongly also recommend low door testing as a great way of quantitatively uh, seeing if people are doing adequate air sealing. This is uh, blower door testing for folks that aren't familiar with it. It's a relatively simple process. You uh, put this assembly inside a, a door, one of the doorways. There's uh, certain steps involved in doing this, but this is a shroud that fits in an aluminum frame and seals off the opening with the door open. And you can barely see it, but right here on that second photo, there's a fan hanging in that opening that's depressurizing the house, and we've got a fancy gauge down here that's measuring uh, the leakage of the house. It actually measures how many CFM of air leakage the house is uh, demonstrating at a particular pressure differential. Great way of quantifying how tight the construction is. Quick review of some particular topics that I wanted to stress. I mentioned water conservation before, uh, dealing with contaminants, air sealing, and ventilation. In terms of water conservation, it couldn't be easier. All you have to do is remember these two terms, gallons per flush and gallons per minute. Uh, commodes uh, use the gallons per flush. I get you folks could guess that, right? Typical standard is 1.28. Uh, and you can go down below that if you care to. The 1.1 gallon per flush commodes are also available. Uh, this WaterSense logo is a great thing to look for, but this uh, link to the MAP toilet test results is a great resource. This, these folks actually test commodes for their um, capacity to remove waste. I don't want to go into great detail about that, but they they use uh, soybean paste as a testing medium, and they tell us exactly which commodes by the model number work and which don't. So if you're choosing um, water-efficient commodes, this is a resource you don't want to miss. Shower heads, 2.2 gallons per minute. Kitchen faucets, 2 gallons per minute. Bathroom faucets, 1.5 gallons per minute. Very standard uh, thresholds for green uh, programs, and you can go below that, too. Um, I strongly suggest the Green Communities Criteria. Very easy to find on the web. They have great information about um, limiting contaminants, and their focus is definitely on low VOC, paints, caulks, adhesives, and sealants. Another icon to look for is the Carpet and Rug Institute's green label icon uh, for carpets and rugs, obviously. And in terms of uh, formaldehyde, uh, it's mostly an issue with composite board products, so specking products with low or no formaldehyde is also very good. All of these things uh, improve the, the healthiness of, of living units, but they are especially important to folks with any kind of respiratory compromise. And it's, it's also been proven that folks can develop respiratory problems over time if they, uh, if they are exposed to high levels of any of these things. A classic EPA diagram of uh, depicting air leakage in homes. 
Uh, the red arrows show air leaking out through the top into the attic, and the blue arrows are cold air leaking in. It's called the stack effect. Natural convection of air going uh, leaking out of the house. Simple to do, extremely cost-effective, and uh, it does a number of things. It saves energy. Air sealing also keeps pests out. It's it's the best chemical-free way of controlling pests, both insects and rodents. It serves as fire stopping, so it's actually a code thing. It limits the movement of contaminants uh, within the house. It also improves comfort by reducing drafts. Simple, cost-effective way to improve the quality of life for folks and save them money. But as we get homes tighter, we have to think about ventilation. And this is a this ASHRAE standard 62.2, which applies directly to the to the um, the, the stock that's typically in NSP uh, programs, uh, uh, three story or less, mostly single family. This is this is a standard for ventilation that uh, enterprises green communities criteria for recruiting enforces as does LEED, and it's. A very simple calculation, 7.5 CFM per occupant. Uh, they, they calculate the number of occupants by adding one to the number of bedrooms and multiplying by that, and also assumes one CFM for every 100 square foot of floor area. So you would do, the equation would be number of bedrooms plus one times 7.5 plus this square footage of floor area divided by 100. And that tells you how many CFM of continuous ventilation you need to meet ASHRAE. There are other ways to meet it, meet the ventilation standard within ASHRAE, but uh, this is the simplest way to do it. And I'll, I'll just refer you to that standard. Um, the <clears throat> regarding regulatory issues, my quick pitch on this topic is is. The, the resource exchange is by far your best resource for information on this. Um, I've, I've done a number of searches on here. So, for example, uh, a search for Davis Bacon uh, delivered 16 um, frequently asked questions. There's another link to a different HUD site here that also has uh, Davis Bacon information. Um, a quick search for Section 504. Um, led to five FAQs on the topic. I'm, I'm a big fan of the Resource Exchange, uh, great website. Quickest, easiest way to get at regulatory issues related to construction and NSP projects. So, any additional questions? I've been talking a lot. Uh, let's see, we do have some questions. Uh, Jeff has one. Jeff, are you there? Yes. Hi. Where are you calling from? Oh, uh, Ohio. The chip programs. The NSP programs. Uh, my question was, when you're doing the blower door test, what is a good percentage? I know you can't give a definite number, but percentage to say it was a good job um, from your readings, to say you're tightening up by 10%, 15% from the initial reading to the final? Um, there's there's a uh, I would say that most of the the older housing stock that we've seen through the MSP program you could cut air leakage in half uh, without much trouble and um, so for instance uh, blower door tests are are expressed in CFM at a pressure differential of with a uh, 50 pascals as the standard. And so, for instance, a it would be a good threshold for houses in, for instance, in the Rochester, New York market where we've done a bunch of, of, of these homes and done that kind of testing. They find it quite easy to get below uh, 1,300 CFM at 50 pascals, which is a good number, a very good number. And I guess what I often recommend to folks is to um, to do some 
modeling of such things in existing housing stock. Test a couple of houses that you where you've done air sealing and and uh, see just to get an idea of what's an appropriate number in your with your housing stock. And a good energy modeler can can also give you very good insight on how um, getting that number lower will uh, uh, improve uh, utility usage. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, got uh, another Jeff or Jeffrey, perhaps. Uh, Jeffrey, what's your question? Where are you calling from? Calling from uh, Southwest Florida. And the question pertains to the products that are being used in the green building. Is there a list that's been generated that contains all of the Buy American products, like um, the coolers or any toilets, a list of toilets that... Test that I, that I referenced um, in, in, the, uh, in the presentation uh, lists almost every manufacturer out there that's available in the country and, and definitely lists the American manufacturers, uh, Kohler or American Standard. And, and shows their products. So that would be one resource that I would strongly suggest for, for finding American brands. Um, uh, there are some references to example products in the specifications. So the specifications will say, um, give some level of performance or s some uh, requirement and occasionally they'll they'll offer an example of a, of a product that might that would meet that that, uh, that so you could also look at the specs. But I don't know of a list of of, of American made products that um, uh, strictly meet the green criteria. I know the other presenters may may be able to speak to that. Thank you, Jeffrey, and uh, thank you, Armand. We'll uh, be able to entertain more questions for Armand uh, at the end of the event. Um, but right now, we've got Ruben Teague of Green Coast Enterprises, and uh, he's going to uh, show us some uh, examples of places he's been involved with. Hi, Ruben. Hey, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? That sounds good. Sounds good? Okay, great. Uh, I... Uh, I'm uh, really thrilled to be on this call today, and thank you, all of you who are listening in. Uh, I think it's great that we've gotten so much interest in this, because I think that uh, green building is certainly where uh, the entire industry is headed, and I think it's exactly where uh, our government-sponsored programs in particular ought to be headed. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what we've done here in New Orleans and the opportunity uh, that uh, that the NSP2 program has given uh, many of the groups here that are helping to rebuild the city uh, to incorporate uh, green building standards into their work. Uh, and I'll talk specifically about uh, the work that my company, Green Coast Enterprises, has been, done and has been doing in conjunction with uh, the builders here in New Orleans. Uh, so this first slide, um, as you can see, is just uh, a reminder that we started off with uh, some tough initial conditions here. Um, about 80% of the housing stock in New Orleans was affected in some way by uh, the hurricanes of 2005, uh, leaving us with uh, quite a lot of uh, blighted and vacant property, as well as uh, homes just in, in need of a lot of repair work. Uh, the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority received uh, just a little under $30 million uh, via the NSP2 program, uh, and the way that they've designed their program is that they're working with 12 different nonprofit development partners, uh, all of whom are groups that were building housing in one way or another here in the city uh, following the storm, uh, some who had been here before the storm doing that. Uh, and uh, it's a, a pretty ambitious program. Uh, the goal is to do 375 single-family new homes, 235 rehabs, uh, also single-family, and then 200 multifamily units. Uh, it's spread out across the city. This next slide just shows a map of New Orleans and the various census tracts that our partners are working in, uh, ranging from you know, numbers one and two, which is kind of the central city part of New Orleans, all the way out to eight, which is New Orleans East, 
and uh, it's a variety of uh, housing types in these areas. It's a variety of return rates from the population. Um, each of the uh, development partners is kind of facing a unique set of circumstances in the neighborhood that they are working in. Um, the development partners themselves, the members of this consortium, are quite varied. Uh, they range from larger organizations that are doing uh, dozens of houses a year to smaller groups uh, working at a slightly lower scale. Uh, there are groups that are very housing focused. There are others that are more like community development organizations where housing is a component of what they do. Uh, prior to the NSP2 program, many of them had very little experience with green building. Uh, but some were also quite sophisticated about it. Um, and, you know, organizations uh, like Make It Right, for example, had been, you know, building lead platinum homes uh, prior to, uh, you know, the NSP2 program. But many others had never even incorporated a single, you know, full green building standard. They've been sort of doing green building quite opportunistically. Uh, there's also quite a range of organizational capacities. Some of these organizations are large. Some are, are very small and, and run on a quite a minimum staff. Uh, it's just a quick slide about my company, Green Coast Enterprises. We do uh, real estate development and project management services. Uh, we're based here in New Orleans. Uh, we uh, focus exclusively on projects that have a triple bottom line, uh, like this one, that have a social justice component as well as uh, an environmental performance component. Um, we uh, you know, try to bring to the table a mix of real estate development expertise along with project management and uh, and green. all of those challenges and all those uh, parts uh, kind of overlap with one another. Um, a little bit about the green building standards in this program. Uh, NORA proposed in their uh, application to HUD to meet both the Department of Energy's Builders Challenge and the Enterprise Green Communities criteria. I'll talk a little bit more about what each of those is. Uh, but that was a very ambitious proposal. And then they decided to get even more ambitious. Uh, once they were awarded the money, uh, they chose to uh, have 50% of the new homes built under the program achieve a HERS score of 50 or below. Um, and they decided to apply the, the HERS criteria to, uh, to the rehabs as well. Um, the HERS score, just for those who don't know, uh, that's an acronym for the Home Energy Rating System. And uh, a HERS score of 100 is basically what you get if you build a house according to current building codes. Uh, if you build a house that produces net zero energy, which is a house that produces as much energy as it consumes, you get a HERS score of zero. Uh, so a HERS score of 70 means you've got a house that is 30% uh, more energy efficient than a typical code-built house. NORA also uh, asked the consortium members to meet additional hazard resilience standards. Uh, we've been working here in New Orleans with our building codes um, and along the Gulf Coast, really. People have been working on tightening building codes to try to get out ahead of the various uh, hazards that we face here. Um, and NORA decided for the purposes of this program that we would be building housing that was much more likely to withstand future storm events than what the building codes require. Um, so the, the, the details about these standards, uh, the Builders Challenge Program is a Department of Energy program. Um, it requires a HERS score of 70 or below. Um, and it also focuses on uh, the building system's performance and durability of the house. So there are additional specifications in there that are all designed around how the home is going to perform as a system. Uh, it's very much a scientific uh, research-based program. Um, it has some fantastic free components to it. Um, and the potential for uh, a lot of uh, free technical assistance, including modeling support, and we were able to bring that into this project uh, through some relationships that we've got. Um, but, you know, I would encourage everyone to find out more about this program and, and about the, the various technical assistance providers and the resources on the DOE website. It's a, it's a great program and one that um, is really trying to, to push the envelope on what we do um, at scale for housing nationally. The other uh, green building program that uh, the New Orleans 
consortium members are working with is the Enterprise Green Communities criteria. And I won't go into uh, too many details about that. Uh, what I will say is that New Orleans chose to meet the Enterprise Green Communities criteria as opposed to others in part because it is really focused on affordable housing production. Enterprise has a long history of uh, supporting affordable housing across the country, and, and they geared their green standards to what it is that those of us in the affordable housing community are thinking about um, while we're developing our projects. And they have created a really fantastic, comprehensive set of criteria uh, that covers uh, many of the things that Armin was just talking about. Um, and, you know, focuses, in my opinion, on the things that are going to matter the most uh, to the occupant. Armin talked about occupant-focused um, approach, and I think that's, that's right. And the Enterprise Green Communities criteria certainly supports that. Uh, just a couple of examples of the things that the criteria ask for. Um, you know, in the, in the energy efficiency area, uh, they ask that uh, you meet the Energy Star standard um, which uh, up until 2010 was uh, required that you get a HERS score of 85 or below. Uh, that's actually going to go down in 2011 to 70 or below, so it lines up really nicely with, uh, with what we're doing here in New Orleans. Um, in the healthy living environment area, uh, the, the, the criteria asks that you not use any uh, wood that's uh, going to have a, a lot of formaldehyde release from it. Um, it also uh, it also focuses on uh, you know not putting carpeting in high traffic areas to the outdoors, um, and any carpeting you're going to put in is going to have to be certified so that it's not releasing uh, VOCs into the house. Um, so you know again you can please take a look at the criteria. It's uh, Enterprise has got a great um, you know very easily uh, readable uh, description of them on its website. Um, this is just a little bit more about the criteria. Just to, for those of you who are thinking, well, I'm doing rehab or I'm doing multifamily, uh, the criteria apply, uh, and actually they've, they've sort of um, broken out um, substantial and moderate rehab so that for those of you that may be, you know, looking at properties that, uh, you know, were foreclosed but are otherwise in good condition, um, and you're just going to be doing, you know, lighter touches on them, uh, you, you've got a standard that works with that. Um, and that anticipates that. Um, there's a link there for more information about Enterprise Green Communities. And again, go ahead and check it out. So in New Orleans, the, the big challenge, um, and those of you uh, thinking about this may, may have already anticipated this, which is that you've got all these different consortium members. You've got uh, a big range of capacity. You've got a big program, and you're trying to get everyone to hit uh, some pretty ambitious standards. So how do you do that? How do you kind of make sure everyone makes it to the finish line? And what uh, Nora decided to do was to have a single TA provider for all of the consortium members. So rather than leave the consortium members to their own devices to figure out how they were going to get there and, and force them to incur uh, both the, the financial and the administrative burdens of doing so. Uh, instead, they've, they've uh, hired us, Green Coast Enterprises, to, to fill that role. And so we work with all of the consortium members uh, starting from the very beginning of their design process to help them make sure that when they build the house, uh, at the end of the day, it's going to meet the builder's challenge and the enterprise green community, everything into a single TA provider that's uh, allowed the entire consortium to build capacity really quickly um, so that, you know, people don't have to go out and find someone on their staff who can fill these roles. Um, we certainly are trying to work with their staff members to teach them as much as we can, and, and some have been really wonderful and have learned a lot in the process. Um, but they're not expected to all become green building experts overnight. Um, the other nice piece of this is, is that you get some economies of scale as you start, you know, uh, adding up the numbers of all the different consortium members' houses, um, you can bring in a lot more resources, uh, and you can bring them in at a lower cost to the entire project. Uh, green Coast Enterprises is also going to be performing some site inspections um, as the, uh, as the process goes along, and we've also brought in some, some more specific uh, uh, contractors who are going to do some of the, uh, the testing that Armin was talking about. 
And again, by unifying everything in one place, uh, you get some economies of scale with that, and you can standardize everything across all the consortium members. So at the end of the day, everyone is getting the same tests, everyone is seeing the same checklist, um, and everyone is, is going to meet the same standards. Uh, well, one other thing I would say uh, on that point is that uh, centralizing things has also made it uh, uh, easier to resolve questions that they've come up. So as individual consortium members have questions, we know those are going to affect other consortium members, and we can work with the folks at DOE and at Enterprise to resolve them and get the answers out to everybody. Uh, so, so far, uh, nine of our consortium members have submitted their uh, plans for energy modeling, um, and three of them have submitted full plans for their enterprise green communities compliance. The rest are um, working on that and, and uh, developing their specs in order to be able to submit them. Uh, we've got about 40 houses under construction, uh, maybe a little more as I sit here today, uh, and we're going to be starting our rehabs and multifamily construction uh, very, very shortly. Um, and so far, so good on you know the integrated uh, the integrated TAPs that appears to have, have run rather smoothly um, and have kept everyone kind of moving along. This is just a photo of a single example of a house that we're building here. Uh, this is a house that's being built using a panelized system, uh, which is why it kind of looks a little odd there. It looks a bit like a cooler on stilts, which is kind of what it is. Um, and you can see in the front there, you've got an erosion control fence that is preventing the uh, dirt from flowing off of the site when it rains. Um, you can see that you've got an elevated structure. We've actually gone well up above uh, what we're required to for, um, for flood insurance levels here. Uh, and those SIP panels are a really wonderful, rigid, insulated system. Um, that will hopefully lead to a very high-performing house. One of the nice things, I think, about these standards is that they have gotten some of these consortium members also thinking about uh, more innovative approaches to construction. It's certainly not required, but, you know, it is one way of, uh, of meeting some of these criteria is to um, move away from, you know, the very, very typical SIP, uh, sorry, SIP, uh, stick, stick built construction. The biggest challenges um, across the program really have had to do with coordination, uh, and that's, you know, something that comes up in all green building projects uh, and all building projects, really. Um, and, you know, we've been working hard to try to make sure that everyone is on the same page from the very beginning. Um, and the, the, the other challenge has been keeping up with plans as they get revised, as well as... Uh, as well as criteria, um, you know, we, we did go out and select both the Builders Challenge and the Enterprise Green Communities criteria at when we submitted our application to HUD. And in the intervening year and a half since then, both of those criteria have undergone revision and uh, have gotten a bit more stringent in their requirements. And that's been a challenge. We've, we've needed to make sure that all of the consortium members stay abreast of that. Um, which has meant that we've needed to stay out in front of it so that we can effectively communicate to them what it is they're going to be doing going forward. Uh, and to that point, I would say that the, the lessons learned have been that keeping uh, team continuity together is really, really critical. Uh, I think that the, the consortium members that have been the most successful with the program have been the ones that have done a good job sort of picking people who are going to run it on their side and keeping those people in communication with us throughout. Uh, the, the staff turnover at the communication point has, you know, always leads to, to additional complications. Um, I think, you know, picking a standard early and, and articulating it clearly is really important. I think Nora did a great job picking some very simple uh, metrics for people to have to hit and getting those metrics out there. Um, and, you know, there, that really has not been an issue. I think people felt like they know exactly where they need to be going. Uh, where they should be driving at uh, with their designs and uh, construction practices. Um, and I think that the centralized TA model has been really effective. I think for given the number of, of different groups and the number of houses that they've been trying to build, I think that uh, it's, it's really been a way of uh, you know, standardizing the process across all of those. Uh, finally, I would just say that, you know, there is a learning curve and you shouldn't underestimate it. But I've been personally really impressed by the way in which uh, people coming from organizations of all types with 
you know, little to no exposure to green building have really gotten energized and inspired by uh, the incorporation of these criteria and standards into the into the process, uh, and have been, you know, I, I think that that's that's actually created a lot of momentum around uh, the NSP2 program here and, and internally at the various consortium members. So. You know, don't don't assume that people just won't won't play ball with this or they're going to see it as a hurdle. I think many have seen it as a challenge. They're they're happy to take on, particularly when you articulate to them the things Armin was talking about around the benefits to their ultimate occupants, um, both the financial benefits and and the health and quality of life benefits. Uh, so that is the end of my presentation. Um, are there questions at this point? Uh, at the moment, we do not, but uh, thank you very much, Ruben, and uh, it's a good time to be thinking about questions you have for Ruben or Armin, and uh, we'll get to those after Amy Hook does her brief presentation on uh, NSP resources. So please submit your questions or raise your hand. Um, there are, actually, there are a couple people in the queue that they were there before you started, Ruben, so I'll, I'll hold those till the end. So we will now switch over to Amy Hook of Enterprise Community Partners, and she'll tell us about resources that are available. Hi, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to the webinar, although you've been here for a while by now. Um, we just wanted to briefly review some of the resources that you might find helpful um, in the construction management and green building portion of your NSP program. So a couple of people have alluded uh, to the wonderful HUD NSP Resource Exchange website. Uh, I, I actually included the link uh, to the toolkit section here on the, on the uh, WebEx, actually the, the slides that you'll be able to download for your convenience. Uh, but just briefly, the Green Housing Development Guide uh, is intended to be used by NSP grantees uh, who want to incorporate green measures into their program. So it's going to incorporate some of the information that green communities learn from incremental cost and measurable savings, uh, which is a study we completed last year. Um, we also, here you see the, the standards, the specifications, and the checklist. The checklist, the checklist might be one of my favorite things because it's so easy for on-site inspection purposes. Uh, so I, I highly recommend you check those out at the HUD uh, Resource Exchange website. Kent, I'm having a hard time forwarding the slides. Oh, there we go. There you go. Good. Thank you. So um, you may be asking, what can I get out of NSPTA? Uh, and there's a lot to offer, really. Uh, green Communities, Enterprise Green Communities has had a wonderful experience working with HUD um, at the headquarters level and also at the local level, um, helping grantees to, to take advantage of this amazing opportunity of uh, HUD NFP technical assistance funding. And here on the screen, you'll see just some examples of what we've done so far. Um, like the customization of the single-family rehab specifications. Uh, this, for example, would be, um, you know, the sample document that we created for HUD, but maybe something different about your area, and, and maybe we need to do a little bit more research for you. We've done that. Um, and then on-site TA is also available as well. These are um, – oh, the – with the NSPTA, you can request that TA help at the HUD Resource Exchange website. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, these are just a listing of the Enterprise Green Communities resources that we created in anticipation of the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Um, it's just another resource for you to use to help grow your program um, and incorporate these green measures. So the case studies we have available are Columbus, which is already online, and Rochester, New York, which should be online soon. Um, <clears throat> you'll also find a great resource in our greenbuildingadvisor.com webpage. It's a webpage that we created specifically for uh, greening NFP programs. So some of the content, just to give you an idea, um, we have a 
educational resources, including construction details, which are really cool. Uh, we also have an NFP-specific green building blog. Uh, we just put a blog up last week, and it, there's usually one going up every other week uh, just to pique your interest and keep you interested in, in the green building world around NFP. So these, again, are the web resources uh, that we wanted to point out to you. And that's really it for me. I think we'll go to questions now. Okay. Thank you, Amy. And see, we promised that part would be brief. And so we will take questions. And I'm also going to unmute all of our presenters, along with uh, John Laswick from HUD. And uh, just so anybody can feel to chime in on questions as you see fit. So let's see. Orlando has been extremely patient here. Orlando's still there. Are you there, Orlando? What's your question? Orlando? No, I guess not. Uh, try again for Orlando. And uh, how about... Uh, Keely, are you there? Yes, hello, can you hear me? I sure can. Where are you calling from? Um, I'm calling from um, the Missouri City, I'm from Missouri City, Texas. Good. <coughs> uh, our That's organization is the Forbin Corps, and we're actually doing uh, demolition and reconstruction for NSP, and my question is, does this Green Building Advisor site also have um, recommendations for new construction, not necessarily rehab? So the, <clears throat> this is Amy. The greenbuildingadvisor.com website, it's got all kinds of information in it, new construction uh, and rehabilitation. But okay. you can also find more resources on the Green Communities website um, okay. for new construction as well. Okay. Okay, yeah, so right now I'm working on my RFQ for my architectural services, and I wanted to refer them to these websites so that they'll know what kind of standards we're looking at. One of the beauties, this is Armin, one of the beauties of the, uh, the Green Building Advisor website is that if you are a subscriber, which does cost a little bit of money, you can also download uh, architectural drawings of details that they recommend for different climates. Oh, wow. Okay, great. So, for instance, wall sections, floor sections, uh, ceiling, attics, ceiling, different parts of the envelope. Very, very good stuff. I honestly forget. I'll tell you what, while we're chatting, I'll, I'll look it up. Okay. Thank you, Keely. Thank you. And uh, let's see. Next, uh, Annette, it looks like. Hi, Annette, what's your question? Where are you calling from? Hello, Annette. I guess Annette is shy, so I will read her question. Uh, let's see, how much is the cost for training nonprofit employees? That's sort of generic. Um, anyone want to? Take a, uh, a stab at your take at that. Sure, Ken. I can I can take that. It depends on the TA provider uh, and the number of participants. But I would say if you are looking for a green training, you may want to try uh, going online and asking for that at the HUD Resource Exchange website. Um, you can request uh, technical assistance from a technical assistance provider through through that, and we can come out and, and deliver the training. At no cost to you. Great. Thanks, Amy. Let's see. Um, I see no more questions at the moment, but I'm sure people are working on them. So hey, Ken? Send, send them to the group. Yeah. This is John and Bree uh, and Hunter. At HUD here, uh, we're sitting in a room that's overly insulated, apparently. It's spreading, but um, <laughs> I just want to make a couple of observations from um, some of the work that I've done with this. Um, 
it, you know, because people, I think, tend to think uh, cost when they think about green. They say, oh, it's more expensive. Um, and uh, I think some of the slides demonstrated that it's not more expensive, uh, or that at least in the long run it's not more expensive uh, when you look at the benefits and so forth. So I think that's an important uh, point to make. But it's still, what you still have to break it down one more step, I think, for people which is to say uh, this additional $2,000 or $4,500 or whatever it is you're going to spend to improve your house um, has these life cycle benefits, but um, you also have a life cycle costing mechanism in your rehab um, loan uh, repayment schedule or your mortgage or whatever it is that you're using to finance the, the sale to the buyer. So. Their, their monthly payment might be a little more because they're buying a little better house, but when they have lower utility payments, that offsets the, the, the monthly cost of the uh, additional uh, premium on the mortgage. So, you know, I think you can easily show people that it's, it either completely covers it or in some cases more than covers the cost from from the get go. So it's not like you've got to wait ten years to sort of achieve all those benefits. <clears throat> you start achieving them right away. Um, the other part, and, and I know Amy, I always harass Amy about being a salesperson, so I was glad that she was selling her training services there. But um, the you know you you have to you have to look at all the benefits of these things. So there's a, there's a you know, there's the environmental benefits and there's the sort of long term cost benefits, but there are other benefits like insulation, uh and uh you know, better insulation it makes your house quieter and more comfortable, not in in addition to being less expensive to heat and cool. So, you know, you know most people appreciate the, the cost savings but they don't always perceive these other benefits that you have to uh, that come along with it. So I think, you know, my rant for, for a long time has been that we need to be better salespeople uh, on this on the green side and, and approach it just like anybody else with a with a good product, which is to find all the things that are advantages, not just the technical advantages, but but the personal comfort and and the occupant advantages, as, as Armand was pointing out, that you know it's got to make sense to people. But there's a lot to to have it make sense, um, so that you know people are actually asking for it and realizing that they can afford it at the same time. That's where you get the scale, I think. Okay, end of rant. <laughs> John, can I can I add on, add on to that, Matt? Unless uh, unless there's someone waiting to ask a question. Oh, please do. Okay, I would just I would just add that um, that that's totally correct, and I think that particularly for those of us in the somewhat more extreme climate zones, either in the deep south or uh, the more northern parts of the country, you know, occupant comfort is a huge part of what you're trying to achieve, and good program and a very thoughtful approach to green building will take into account occupant comfort uh, as as part of what it's doing. Uh, you know, one of the things that the Builders Challenge program does is, is think a lot about that um, and, and how building science kind of, even if you're not necessarily changing the energy performance out bottom line, you may very well be making a house a much more pleasant place to live. Uh, and then the other the other thing I would say is that uh, you know many of the things that that you want to do in a green building program are things that you know people are, that are going to make the houses much more appealing at the other end. And so you're actually producing a much better affordable housing community has totally figured out how to pitch that and how to sell that. But I think it needs to be an important part of these. So if you're if you're going to go to the effort and the trouble, um, such as it is, of incorporating green building standards into your program, also think about the other side of it. Think about the marketing side and think about the, the public relations side of it and make sure that you're getting that message out there so that people understand that you've built a much better product uh, than you otherwise might have. Yeah, I agree with that. I used to tell people, do you want to keep sending money to the electric company or do you want to build equity in your house? I mean, if you've got a better house, then the little bit of extra that you're paying for it, uh, even if it nets out at zero, is actually going to you and not to uh, some utility executive's retirement plan. 
Oh, always good to have a bad guy in every scenario. Absolutely. <laughs> Helpful, for sure. And let's, uh, I, I think we, I think, uh, this is Armin. Uh, I think we, we underplay the health benefits. Yeah. Uh, and, and we need to, we need to develop the risk to help convince people that, uh, there are significant health benefits to living these homes. They're a little less tangible sometimes, but uh, you'd be surprised at how many people already have the health problems, and when you give them a better uh, option, they're ready for it. Um, so, you know, that, there's your sort of initial momentum, I think, is there, there's a there's a latent demand for, you know, better indoor air quality, uh, people with uh, allergies and, and, you know, other kinds of conditions. But, again, you've got to get that whole list of benefits out there for people to perceive. You know, they might, we might see those, or we, we might even miss a couple. But, uh, you know, somebody that's coming into this new, uh, you know, they, they, we need to explain, you know, why, why this is better, how this is better. Well, you're the poster child today, John. You've got the, the office building that isn't properly ventilated. <laughs> <laughs> I want to break the window, but I don't think that's a good idea. Sweating in the middle of winter. So we've got uh, Bob uh, with a question. Bob, where are you calling from? Uh, Bob Jones, City of Springfield, Missouri. Uh, we got NSP funds through our state, and uh, one of our partners is uh, in the process of getting ready to sell some of the NSP houses after they've been rehabbed, uh, how do you get the appraisers to come in line with some of the increased, quote, sales prices due to the green or energy star functions? They don't, you know, they don't factor in the savings for utilities as a value typically unless somebody's got some tips for that. Well, I think that, I mean, that, that has been a problem, uh, I think, and it is, it is a problem that, uh, you know, the appraisal industry has got at an industry-wide level. Um, you know, there are, uh, now programs that exist, uh, for real estate education programs for appraisers that are targeted at explaining to them how environmental performance could or should impact property values. Uh, those are kind of nascent Programs, uh, but you know, I, I you know, I, and I have no idea what's available in Missouri in particular. But I would say here in Louisiana, you know, that is some that's a challenge that we have worked uh, worked on without a ton of success to date. Uh, we're actually organizing a conference here in March, um, which any of you who would like to come down to New Orleans in mid March are encouraged to attend. Uh, it is a conference around green real estate finance, and one of the big questions there is how do you get your property valuations in line with the added value, um, and wh- how do you how do you also connect that to financing as well? Um, and that's that's I think the the exact right question to ask, and I don't think that there's a real easy answer out there, unfortunately. Yeah, this is John. I I, I agree with that. I mean, I think it's just going to take some time. People have to see these. Uh, these kinds of units before they start to understand that they are better and believe that they are better. But the good news is that you don't have to recover all your costs in the NSP program. So, I mean, we want you to do as many units as possible, but the opportunity here is to is to feed some of this activity by, uh, you know, underwriting, you know, writing it down, essentially, subsidizing it a little bit more. If you can't get your appraisers to go where you need to go, uh, that doesn't mean you can't sell the house. It just means you're going to get a little less back on it. So uh, I, I don't think that should be a barrier to you. Uh, and, and then after a couple of years, when people start seeing this and, and they understand the, the, the value, then you'll start to see it showing up in appraisals. But I think it's going to take some time. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And uh, let's see who's next. Let's uh, try Orlando again. Orlando, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, now we can, yes. Go ahead. Uh, where are you yeah, calling from? What's your question? Yeah, I'm calling from Pompano Beach, Florida. And, um, I'm basically doing 80% of my NSP is rehab. And I'd like to see who I could get some training on bringing a green building into Pompano Beach. Um, 
Uh, said 80% of my MSP is rehab and about 20 is in construction. Amy, you want to click that one? <laughs> sure. So if you, have you been to the HUD um, NSP help website or the resource exchange website? Uh, no, not as yet. Okay. Um, if, what, what I'd like to do is actually send you, email you the link to the website um, uh -huh. so, that, so that you know exactly how to go on. And you can actually request um, help from HUD to send a TA provider out to your location to help you develop the training to go along with your green program. Um, but I, I would suggest that you take a look at the documents that we reviewed, uh, those resources that were create, that HUD created. Um, to help you kind of figure out your program first, and then we could, we'll, or you can ask for TA assistance to help you, um, you know, figure out your, your green program as well. Uh, but the, the help is there. You just go online and, and request that TA assistance. So, Kit, is there a way for me to get his email address from the WebEx system? Uh, yeah, we can, uh, we can do that. And also, and you can see the, the web address here on this slide. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and that's got... And you can just um, request... Go ahead. And you can just request assistance at this website. Okay. So in addition to um, archives of all the previous HUD NSP webinars, there's all kinds of additional information, including um, a place to request training and technical assistance. Well, thank you, Orlando. Appreciate it. Uh, can I have an answer on the cost of the access to the Green Building Advisor? Um, they call it Green Building Advisor Pro. It's uh, $15 a month or $150 a year. So fortunately, you can subscribe for a brief period of time and relatively affordably at $15 a month. I think that was Keeley's question. I think that's right. Good. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate sure. that. Uh, I see Vincent has his hand up, but uh, no phone next to your name. Sorry, Vincent, I can't unmute you, uh, but maybe you could submit your question in the Q&A box. And while we're seeing if additional questions come in, let me uh, remind you of uh, what you know, just a, a lot of uh, webinars are coming up, at MSP webinars over the next few months, month and a half. Um, perhaps with more on the way after that, but this is what we uh, know. This is at least most of what we know about now. Lots of different programs for you. And again, you can uh, find more information about those at the HUDNSPHelp.info website. Kent, could I add something about the blower doors? That seemed to be a little sure, yeah, fair there's amount there's of uh, a little bit exchange of about that point. Blower doors, sure. The, uh, <clears throat> there was there was a question I can't remember who it was from about uh, uh, you know sort of a target for improvement and I I know I was a little I'm hesitant to give uh, numbers or or uh, suggest a particular threshold for folks and in part because the impact that air sealing has varies dramatically by climate. Uh, if you're in a very mild climate, it has much less impact because there's much less of a stack effect, much less uh, risk of, of uh, air being circulated through the home through air leaks. So my, I, what I suggest typically is folks uh, have a, uh, someone who can do energy modeling who has access to software to do this. Ruben referred to this, and HERS raters are an example of those folks. And because they can do, through software analysis of your building, uh, give you a projection of what's a good number to reach. Uh, and I'd be interested in, in uh, Ruben and Amy's uh, take on that as well. But uh, I, I think it's such a climate-specific issue and also fairly specific to the type of housing stock uh, that it's, it's, it's better to... Uh, to arrive at good numbers 
or projections uh, for air sealing through modeling. Yeah, I, I you know we've we've certainly participated in a number of uh, efforts here to do modeling of houses pre rehab. Uh, it's, you know, it's a real challenge, basically, to model something that is not uh, sealed up already as a house um, and a little difficult to know exactly what your improvements are. But when you're dealing with a structure that's actually got walls in place, uh, you can do a pretty good job figuring out, you know, what, what improvement you got from, from air sealing. Um, although we typically do both air sealing and some level of insulating as well, uh, at the either ceiling line or roof line, uh, because many of the houses we're working with here don't have any insulation at that point. And really, if you're, if you're not doing that, you're not really doing a whole lot. So, uh, you know, I, we have seen improvements, um, you know, in those projects that, uh, you know, for a, you know, a single family, uh, you know, a thousand to fourteen hundred square foot home, uh, that have ranged from uh, 15% to 35% or 40%. Um, I, and that's, that is in total energy consumption. I think in terms of air leakage rates, you know, I think we have been getting that 50% number, um, you know, on the number of the houses we've done. Okay. But, it, but I agree, it, it is very climate specific. Certainly, the effect of doing the air sealing on your energy costs is very, very climate specific. I mean, if you're in if you're in Santa Barbara, California, why why bother air sealing at all? It's nice there all the time. But uh, if you're if you're down here in New Orleans or if you're in North Dakota, that's that's obviously gonna gonna make a big big difference. Yeah. We have uh, done through our work in different cities. We've done some modeling of what we call typical housing stock. Uh, as a way of trying to determine what what are the measures that will um, almost universally give the best bang for their buck, and we and I you know I think one of the things that that's, that's happening now is that the Builders Challenge Program is turning its attention to rehab, and I think that's a national trend is we're paying more attention to to rehab, and I think hopefully that means that the models are going to get better. Um, my experience with the modeling software that's out there is that it is um, it's a little crude when it comes to doing rehab work, and uh, I think as we start doing more of these houses and getting more data, we're going to get a better sense of how to how to model them properly. So the predictions should get more accurate going forward. So Vincent has uh, submitted his question and. He's uh, interested in result communities or Energy Star or LEED and uh, wondering about the return on investment um, there. And it uh, sounds like he's especially interested in if there is uh, a difference between the originally estimated savings and the actual savings that occurred. Can, can any of you speak to that? Uh, I can, Ted. Um so, Vincent, I don't uh, know of any on Earthcraft or Energy Star or Lead for Homes, but uh, for green communities, uh, we have um, a study that we did and released. It's called Incremental Saving, Incremental Cost Measurable Savings, and you can find it on our website. And we did actually measure the or compare the estimated. Uh, versus the actual. So the energy modeling, what we predicted uh, the energy savings would be, and then a year later went back and got the utility release and, and um, had the actual savings um, around energy. So and like I said, you can find that study, and there's, there's more to it besides just that. We actually measured the development cost, um, regular construction development cost uh, against what it would cost to go green. So in some areas, like in Portland, Seattle, uh, California, the costs have come down to the point of green, cost of green building has come, come down to a point where there's no cost at going green. Um, now, not everywhere in the country is experiencing that. Uh, so what we, we did, we measured uh, the cost to go green, the estimated benefit, and the actual benefit achieved. 
I just put the name of that uh, publication and the website in the chat window. Thank you for that question, Vincent. Uh, there's, there are groups nationally, Advanced Energy, out of Raleigh, North Carolina, that are doing, they have a program where they predict the savings and, and actually guarantee the savings from an energy standpoint, which is pretty impressive. There was a group out of Chicago that was doing the same thing. So um, I, I think it is possible to do, but it's, but it tends to be local programs that are very familiar with their housing stock and uh, climate that are able to do that. Uh, and I would agree with, with Ruben's assessment that the software isn't terribly precise, but I, I do think it's fairly accurate on a comparative basis, meaning uh, while it may not be able to, may, it, it may be difficult unless you've spent a lot of time working locally with, with the program to predict a specific dollar amount savings, software can do a, a fairly decent job of telling you, relatively speaking, which measures will do a better job. I might mention, too, that um, a lot of times utility companies will have that kind of information and, in many cases, will partner with communities that are trying to do this. Uh, my personal experience was that the gas company and electric, electric company didn't like working with each other, but um, individually they were helpful. Yeah, I, you know, we know a lot actually about commercial green building. We know less about home green building. Uh, you know, in the commercial area, there's just a lot more data uh, that has been gathered over a longer period of time, in part because standards have been in place for commercial green building for a little bit longer um, at, a, at, at more scale. Um, and, you know, ROIs in the commercial space, uh, you know, come in anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. Um, pretty consistently, uh, and you get, uh, you know, and people are, are pushing those boundaries, I think, all the time, uh, and I would expect that we're going to see very similar data start to come out of uh, the residential green building programs that we've got. It's just that they are, they're a little bit younger, and they obviously don't have the same kind of, um, you know, sort of built-in data gathering pieces that you get in a... Uh, in a commercial program. I see no more questions and uh, wonder if any of you have any final words you'd like to leave us with. Well, I okay. Uh, <laughs> we've got a, when, when you do leave this webinar, there's a be taken to a survey page, a survey monkey page with a few questions on it. We'd appreciate you taking a couple moments to give us some feedback about this webinar. And I'd like to thank our presenters today, Armin Magnelli, Ruben Teague, and Amy Hook, um, and the participation of John Laswick from HUD2. Thank you all for being here today, and thanks to the participants for your interest, and we look forward to seeing you soon on another HUD NSP webinar.